War has always been one of the most popular aspects of the study of history and it's no surprise. Why battles that dethroned kings shifted borders and ultimately changed the course of history are as fascinating as they are important. Let's discuss in detail but before continuing the topic a soft reminder of pressing the subscribe button if you haven't already yet. Our unfortunate inability to travel backwards in time and view said battles in person. It's disappointing we know more than a few misconceptions about history's wars have piled up as the years have gone by. Thanks to depictions in TV shows, video games and of course subpar public education. Today we're going to tackle a few of these misconceptions and clear up some things about historical warfare that seem to be stubbornly cemented in public opinion. What do you think of warfare hundreds of years ago? Often the first thing that comes to mind are grand sieges of epic castles with armies surrounding a massive stone fortress hurling giant rocks over the walls as flaming arrows rain down around them. But the whole idea of castle siege is packed full of misconceptions first of all these types of battles were not over quickly. It wasn't as simple as firing the trebuchet at the walls and running down the gate in just a few hours. In fact, a successful siege could take months depending on how well defended the castle was. For example, the siege of Kenworth Castle battle in the Second Baron's War took six months before the garrison in the castle surrendered. The defenders in the castle held out this long thanks to the castle's structure location and their weapons but this leads us into another misconception about Agrian warfare. You've probably heard before that hot oil would be poured on the heads of the attacking soldiers. This is such a common myth that it is present in many movies and video games, but it doesn't appear to be all that based in reality or at least it wasn't very common. The truth of the matter is the oil was a rare and pricey commodity of the day making it far from the first thing you'd want to stockpile purely for the purpose of burning and dropping on some unfortunate soul below. The other thing is the logistics of not only heating up a sufficient amount of oil but getting a huge boiling bout of it up to a high point on the walls. There are some recorded incidents of similar tactics such as an anecdote from the North Siege of Chester where the Anglo-Saxons boiled ale and ped it on the Vikings below peeling their skin off before throwing down the town supply of beehives certainly a nightmare for whatever Viking was on the receiving end of the beer and bees combo. This incident is the only one that mentions such a tactic and it also isn't exactly verified at the end of the day oil was simply too rare to stock power for use in case of a siege but there's no doubt that desperate times call for desperate measures and it's likely that oil was thrown through murder holes on advancing soldiers below. Just in much smaller quantities and not as part of the large-scale organized defense in fact what is known is that when push came to shove basically anything would be thrown at the attackers through these murder holes including hot sand human waste and even corpses. Another misunderstanding centers around the use of line infantry which you'll see depicted in movies or in museums as two armies lining up and taking turns firing their muskets until the other one retreats. When put in such simple terms many see it as a terrible tactic and one that could be easily exploited by other strategies like spreading out or using quicker weapons even an enemy armed with bows and arrows might be more effective because they can fire a lot more quickly. Most battle tactics throughout history line infantry rose to fame because of its effectiveness especially in contrast to other options having your men grouped together in close proximity provides a few advantages that made it so useful. The first of these is the ability to receive and follow out orders with these if the men were spread out in smaller groups out of earshot. It would be far more difficult to order your men to regroup focus fire or retreat. Changing formation is a cumbersome endeavor and any way to simplify. This could have had a huge impact on the battlefield tight formations also meant that something of a rhythm could be employed. Ensuring that every individual soldier was firing and reloading as often as he could, another advantage is the inherent defense against cavalry charge. Soldiers spread out in small groups are highly vulnerable to cavalry sweeping in and slicing them up one GP at a time given that a musket only allows a single shot in the fact that they weren't super accurate. Horses are on top of you whereas a huge swarm of muskets means that the approaching rider needs to charge through. There are quite a few things wrong with that notion. Firstly, one of the advantages of a musket is that it's not just a rifle and when it's got a bayonet on it. It's essentially a spear allowing for a large group of soldiers to charge and engage in melee combat. This also allows them to take and hold territory such as a hill or fort whereas small groups of archers would be easily repelled. Archers generally didn't engage in melee combat as their specialty was ranged warfare. The other issue is that training men to be proficient with a bow and arrow is a surprisingly expensive process. To be a deadly archer requires years of training and maintained muscle mass in the arms and back. While becoming a proficient musketeer is about as simple as learning to aim fire and reload. 
Losing an archer is losing a skilled asset while the grim reality is that musket-wielding troops were rather replaceable put succinctly. The age of the burn arrow had passed and for good reason. Finally, there's the aspect of morale and confidence. When the first volleys begin to be fired off a lot of smoke will be put into the air. Often obscuring quiet, a bit of the battlefield being on yacht lonesome or with a few other men without much visibility could lead you to hesitate in your advance. But they did know what they were doing line infantry was used for example by Napoleon's armies who adjusted the tactics depending on the terrain and would often use the line to advance beyond a certain point. Before changing formation to avoid falling prey to cannon fire similar tactics included column formations and infantry squares. All of which might look a bit primitive from a modern perspective but were certainly effective in their time. Now this next misconception is largely the fault of Hollywood but there seems to be a general belief that ancient battles began with both sides charging full speed at each other with the battlefield erupting into thousands of one-on-one -on -one duels now this looks great on film. Especially because it allows the scene to focus on a single character and how they're faring in combat. But it's not how things actually went down tactics long ago including those of the Romans the Greeks and even as far back as the ancient Egyptians were far more organized. They often get credit for rushing the enemy a speedy charge was something that was reserved for cavalry or chariots because a tight formation would easily repel such an advance by men on foot. In fact, this organization is what led to some of history's greatest armies take Alexander the Great for instance who conquered much of the known world in his twenties thanks to excellent strategy and command of his troops chief among these was the Macedonian falling a popular formation. Employed a tight group of soldiers each wielding a long pike generally in a 16 by 16 man square you could just imagine how useless it would be to charge headfirst to such a formation with your sword drawn no amount of bravery is going to get you through that wall of long spears. It's especially effective against horses along with the flanks. Alexander had his battle formations tightly structured with the cavalry generally on the sides to flank the enemy while the infantry made up the center. His plans of attack were carefully thought out especially against the Persians who often outnumbered the Macedonian army. It was only through expert preparations and perfect execution that he was able to achieve so much. Later the Romans also add a highly organized military with a strong emphasis on a standardization of their army across their huge territory. At their peak strength Roman legions were imbued with a strong sense of discipline cohesion with their comrades and obedience on the battlefield. If they would have fought every battle by breaking formation and charging into enemy lines. They would have never become the historical dominant power that you know them for today. One thing a lot of people have been misled about is the weight of a full suite of medieval plate armor. You may have an image in minds that knights were incredibly slow and bulky but that the protection provided by the armor was simply worth the loss of mobility. The reality is that plate armor was not nearly heavy enough to severely limit mobility. Estimates vary depending on time and region but in general a full set didn't weigh a whole lot more than 55 pounds or 25 kilos. This is far from the old myth of being so heavy that knights needed a crane to be lifted onto their horse and for some reference a soldier in a modern army is typically trained to carry backpacks even heavier than this weight. So clearly, it's not an unreasonable amount knights wearing plate armor were also a lot more flexible than you'd expect especially when tailor made to the knight that would be wearing it. The armor provided a surprising amount of mobility with flexible joints in the elbows, shoulder, neck ankles and everywhere else. You might need to bend in the heat of combat myths that meteor armor was incredibly heavy and immobile. Really don't make much sense when you think about it after all if the armor was indeed that restrictive the best strategy would be to avoid wearing armor yourself and just knock them off their horse or push them onto the ground and hit them as they're just struggling to get back up. Knights needed to be able to get to their feet quickly, walk, run, and fight all while being protected and medieval armor did exactly that. It's a testament to just how skilled the armorsmiths of the past were to create something of such impressive quality. When you think of great soldiers throughout history whether it be medieval knights or the formidable Spartan warriors the image that generally drums to mind includes a man holding some sort of sword now make no mistake swords have been a big part of warfare since antiquity and long been one of the most reliable weapons around. But there are quite a few things that people don't seem to realize about them. The first is how prevalent they actually were. Because contrary to what you might think swords were not the go melee weapon for most soldiers throughout history. We've already mentioned the Macedonian falling with its long pikes and this is a perfect example armed with a sword. You're going to have a tough time getting close enough to swing at a person holding a 6 meters pike or some sort of long spear and that's why these weapons with much more reach became some of the most used. They were simply superior in most situations, 
especially when grouped together throughout medieval and renaissance times one of the most popular weapons was the polearm. A polearm is similar to a spear but with a modified head that can allow for slicing in addition to thrusting. There were dozens of polearm varieties with some sporting a long curved blade and others appearing more like an axe. But what they all had in common was the great reach that they provided a soldier. The leverage given by the length of the wooden handle allowed the user to generate a lot of force making it more effective against armor horsemen and shields. It's also important to remember that a sword isn't the most useful weapon to use while riding on horseback instead knights would often use long lancers instead of needing to swing their sword. As they rushed past an enemy the point of the lance would allow them to transfer their horse's speed directly into the enemy with high accuracy. Lances are often depicted as a weapon of pure sport used only in jousting but their use in history's battles is not only extensive but surprisingly recent cavalry armed with lancers were deployed all the way up to the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and even in World War I but of course by this point they proved ineffective against trenches machine guns and artillery. It's also important to point out that in the event a knight or other soldier throughout history did use a sword. They would have swung them with ease because contrary to what many believe swords were far from heavy. For example, the famous Scottish Claymore was only around 2.5 kilograms or 5.5 pounds. Still requiring strength to properly wield but far from being so heavy that only a select few could swing it. The same goes for the large Xander whose largest variants weighed in at around 4 kilograms or 8.8 .8 pounds. Swords much heavier than this weight were simply impractical and were either wielded by only a few select strong men or reserved for ceremonial display. Whenever you watch a history battlefield movie, please keep in mind these information and for more such information please hit the subscribe button and join the journey of knowledge. Thanks for watching.